of that. I noticed that especially in the West, there is this characterization of what's happening as some sort of a dichotomy between, on one way, nice liberals, people who know which wine would go with the right dinner dish, versus uh, Islamists who are usually portrayed with big beards and, and wild eyes and look at the cameras in a very aggressive, pugnacious way. And in my view, to be honest, it's, it's quite, I don't want to say childish, but it's certainly wrong in my view. Because number one, you have a definition issue here. Many of the so-called Arab liberals, the only thing that really combine them together is that they do not want religion, not only Islam, by the way, in Lebanon, for example, Christianity. They do not want religion as the frame of reference for the society. But from a social point of view, many of the values that here in Europe you would define as liberal, they would oppose to have in their own societies. So they are politically secularists rather than socially liberals. And I think it's very important to reflect on that one because, again, I look at the whole point from a social point rather than just political distinction. And on the Islamist side, I also believe that there is very much a simplification when you just portray the Islamist movements in this stark way. Yes, there are very much aggressive forces within political Islam across the region, certainly in Egypt, certainly in Jordan, Syria, Morocco, Algeria, the Gulf. But even within political Islam or socio-political Islam, you do have moderate groups actually. And surprisingly, you'll find some very liberal groups within political Islam. For example, people sometimes don't reflect on the fact that three of the most interesting, in my view at least, leaders within very active Islamic groups in Egypt have PhDs from top American universities, such as Stanford, for example, spent more than 10 years in the US, they speak perfect English, are excellent in, in interaction with the West, and when you ask them about their own personal identity, they will tell you political Islam. So it's not just this simple characterization. You need to, in my view, especially as stakeholders, Europe, in my view, is a major stakeholder, you need to have this subtle, more nuanced understanding, in my view, between these two macro narratives for these societies. I will finish by one point, which is, what are the potential positive scenario for these societies? And what's the potential negative scenario for these societies? And again, I'm looking at the Arab world in general. But of course, Egypt here is very important, as President Martin said, because Every single trend that has shaped the Arab world over the past at least 200 years has emerged out of Egypt. Modern state, constitutional monarchy, political Islam in its modern form, militant Islam, Arab nationalism, fight against Western interests, fight against Israel, peace with Israel, being part of the American alliance in the Middle East, coexistence between Muslims, Christians, and Jews in the Arab world, and then repelling all of that and macro-sectarianism, all of this actually emerged out of Egypt and then spread to the Arab world. So Egypt here is crucial. But back to my point. Obviously there are so many dynamics, but I'll put in front of you two scenarios. One is potentially sad for this part of the world, whereby you effectively have this momentum that has been created this year, lost. And I think this scenario is not necessarily will come from military establishments stopping the process as many people reflect on right now. I don't think this is really a major effect. And not necessarily from Islamist players stopping the momentum. I also don't think this is a major threat. For me, one of the most important threats right now is regional dynamics. And I would, I would ask you to reflect on one point. For the past 35 or 40 years, effectively since the fall of Arab nationalism, the regional foreign policy, regional positioning, has never been set by the Arabs. Never. Since the fall of Arab nationalism in the late 60s, the American <coughs> presence in the Middle East, Pax Americana as they say in political science, became the established norm in the Middle East. And it had two pillars. Number one, of course, Israel, number two, Saudi Arabia. And Egypt 
became to a large extent a third leg somehow. But it was the American narrative, and some would say supported by Israeli slash Saudi, but American narrative in the region. And then we have the earthquake of the Iranian revolution in the late 70s. And for the whole 80s, the Iranian view dominated certainly certain parts of Iraq, Bahrain certainly, the eastern province of Saudi Arabia, which is very Shiite. It became the dominant norm, at least in, in Lebanon, for example, and even extended non-theologically, but politically, to Egypt. And then in the 90s, something interesting happened. Israel put forward its own narrative for the integrated Middle East. Isaac Rabin and Shimon Peres put forward the idea of an economic integration in the Arab world or the Middle East, including Israel, including Turkey, and of course that had momentum after the Madrid Peace Conference in 1991 and the Oslo Agreement in 1993. And in the last seven or eight years, Turkey came to the Middle East and came to the Middle East with a very modern ideas, but basically heritage of the Ottoman Empire. Very modern ideas, but basically heritage of socio-political Islam. And very modern notions, but still. If you look at that very briefly, American, Iranian, Israeli, Turkish, but the Arabs were not there. The Arabic narrative was not there. And in my view, I might be wrong, but my view is that you are seeing a new state emerging in Egypt, and it will emerge. Certainly, a new state will emerge. You will see new states emerging in Tunisia and Libya, and they will emerge. And I will put my credibility on the line and say, and the Syrian regime will fall, in my mind, no doubt. And there will be a new state coming out in Syria. Now, historically, and I don't want to bore you, but historically, all of these countries have always been supportive of an Arabic notion, in whatever way, coming out of Egypt. It's going back to a thousand years. Always has been the same. If you argue that you are going to see a new narrative coming out of Egypt supported by these countries, that narrative will not be very valiant ally of the US as it has been in the past 30 or 40 years. It will not be a follower of Saudi Arabia as it has been. It will not be a close ally slash friend of Israel. It will pursue its very, very Arab nationalist interests in the Middle East. These certainly would clash with Israel's, certainly would clash with America's. I would argue there's a high chance for a confrontation, ideas confrontation, between Egypt and these new states behind it, and Saudi Arabia at one point in time. I would also argue that you will find serious clashes, ideas clashes again, between Egypt and these countries behind it, and Iran. And despite the apparent closeness now between Turkey under AKP, and the Arab world, I would say, in my view, you potentially will see even potential ideas confrontation between a surgent Egypt with its own interests and Turkey that's trying to carve its own influence in the region. And remember, at one point in time, and you know about politics much more than I do, of course, the AKP at one point in time would lose power. Party fatigue, as usual, would be out. And there would be different administrations in Turkey. And the second largest army in NATO, if it has uh, a different political masters, might not necessarily have the same foreign policy in the region. The point I'm trying to say, you are entering a stage whereby the new states emerging in the Arab world and at their core, Egypt, will pursue very different foreign policies. And potentially there's very high chances of ideas confrontations. If that happens, then there will be tension in the region. There will be an antagonization of the middle classes. And usually, who benefits from such environments? The military establishments across the region, typically. The hardliners, the religious hardliners. And who usually loses in such milieu? Liberals, seculars, modern moderates. If that happens, then we potentially have a scenario whereby the momentum given over this year will be lost. And we go into not only very dynamic confrontations, again I'm not saying war, but I'm saying ideas confrontations in the region, but there will be a feedback circuit inside these countries, Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, Syria, which will not benefit democracy.